to publish her Unmasked, a series of virtual conversations with inspiring and influential book women from around the world. As you'll know, Publisher is a worldwide community of female publishing leaders, and we're working to tackle the publishing industry's still entrenched gender imbalances, particularly pronounced at the executive level. Since September, Publisher Unmasked has been moving around the world, one region at a time, and it's my pleasure to be interviewing book women from Europe. A new edition of Unmasked is available every week or so on the Publisher YouTube channel if you want to follow that. My name is Jo Henry. I'm Managing Director of Book Branch, the online trade ma magazine for the publishing industry operating out of the UK. And today I'm really excited to be speaking to Margaret Busby, OBE, publisher, writer, editor, broadcaster and activist, and this year Chair of the Booker Prize Committee which I think is a, a real accolade. I mean, it's the highest of the high, really, isn't it? Margaret, I'm so delighted you can be with us today. Thanks. Um, you've got a life of two parts, and I'm going to try and you know, talk about <laughs> both of them, if that's possible. So you founded Alison and Busby in 1967, when you had only just left university, which is the most extraordinary achievement. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that came about, what you were trying to achieve, um, how you met Clive Allison, and what mm -hmm. convinced you you could set up a publishing company? Well, okay, let me start from how I met Clive Allison. I, I had um, been at school in Sussex, a boarding school. In, in the holidays, I, I um, stayed with a family called the Andersons, run by a writer called Verily Anderson, who would take in children on holidays because my, my, my parents lived in Ghana. My father was a doctor in, in the rural areas. And uh, my sister, Eileen, and I had been sent to school in Britain uh, because there were no schools where my father was practicing. And we went to this school in uh, bexhill on sea and in the holidays, we, we stayed with uh, Beverly Anderson. And in fact, my first experience as an editor was helping Beverly type her books, I think. And she had five children, one of whom, Rachel Anderson, was about my age and became a writer as well. And in 1965, Rachel Anderson was having her first novel published and was having a party. And she was also about to get married and the party was to celebrate that. And the party was held in 100 Bayswater Road, which was a house where her cousins lived. And in fact, it was also where J.M. Barry wrote Peter Pan. Okay. And so I was invited as a friend of Rachel's and her fiance, later husband, David Bradby, invited his friends, including somebody he was at university with called Clive Allison. And I, at my college, Bedford College, London University, I'd been doing things with my college magazine and writing poetry. And as happens at parties, I was introduced to somebody also doing things at their college and to do with publishing. And we were discussing what we might do after university. And we said, let's start a publishing company. So <laughs> the idea was conceived when we were both still undergraduates. Uh, the confidence <laughs> of youth, it's amazing, well, isn't it? That's exactly it. We were both interested in poetry and we both wanted to, in fact, I was writing poetry. I, I, I remember sending Clive some of my poems, which I think he quoted in his finals, which probably didn't help him much. Mm. But we wanted to publish poetry books in cheap editions that young people like ourselves could afford. So when we left university, I, I left... Um, when I was 20, I, I graduated and, and we met up again. I, in fact, people always assume that Clive and I were some sort of item, but actually I got I was married to a jazz musician. So it was strictly a business relationship between Clive Allison and myself. Goodness, you got married very young, didn't you? I know, in those days you went out with somebody a couple of times and you got married. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, so my husband um, was a jazz musician, but Clive and I decided we were going to start publishing cheap poetry books. So we, we ended up producing these five Bob poetry books, an electric typewriter, and we didn't know how many copies to print. So we ended up with 15,000 paperback poetry books. Wow. And no distribution. 
And, and so, where are they now? Do you know? Well, no, we, we managed to sell them all. But, I mean, I, we started out stopping people in the street saying, would you like to buy a poetry book or, or knocking on doors? Yeah. Um, I think eventually we, we, we got some help with distribution from Andre Deutsch, actually. But we started not knowing anything at all about the industry. And it was simply out of, as you said, the sort of boldness of youth and thinking we could do anything. We had no experience of any sort of jobs. We had no dependents, no mortgages to worry about. So that's how we started. Mm -hmm. And it was an experience, you know, it's a a wonderful experience actually. It was was just doing what we we wanted to do, not knowing what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, over the years, Alison and Busby has obviously published some exceptional books, some literary books, some very successful books. I think you did the Jill Murphy's Worst Witch Worst series, Witch. which That's is right, you know yeah. part of everyone's childhood, um, and is still going now, of course. So you know, no, whatever I'm no, you not did, connected with it. My name is there, but I'm, I'm not. Connected. I know. I was going to ask that actually. What's it like having your name connected to a publishing company that actually you have no connection to anymore? It's kind of weird. I, I think a lot of people probably think I'm still there. And mm. sometimes I get emails forwarded from the current some publisher, um, from people who do think I'm there, or people. In fact, I got an email today, somebody saying, you know, Alison and Bubby published this in the 90s. Would you like to be published? I had to write back and say, actually, <laughs> I wasn't there when whatever it was was published, and therefore yeah. I can't decide to republish it. So mm. no, it, it's it's weird. It's, uh, but I, I wonder what Mr. Marks or Mr. Spencer felt like. <laughs> well, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so over, I think you worked there for 20 years in the end, didn't That's you? Right, yeah. um, and so say a little bit about kind of what you think you achieved and, and what impact you think the, the press had. Well, we started out doing Alice and Busby in evenings and weekends because we obviously we had no money. So mm. Clive Alice and I, and I both got jobs with other publishing companies. Okay. Um, And I was working with a company called the Crescent Press, which then got taken over by Barry and Jenkins, Barry and Rockcliffe. And uh, Clive was working, I think, for Panther and Macmillan. And then we found a book that we thought, this is the one we're gonna go full time with. Mm -hmm. And it was a novel by an African American who had been trying to get his novel published, his first novel published for a long time, it had been turned down by more than 40 publishers on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. And he was on holiday on a Greek island called Mykonos with his wife, and he bumped into a friend of my husband called Alexis Lickyard and was telling Alexis about his novel. And Alexis said, I know somebody who started a publishing company. So anyway, cut a long story short. Sam came to London, I worked on the novel with him to edit it. And Clive and I decided this was the book we were going to go full time on. Mm -hmm. And so we left our jobs and we, in fact, I think we we sort of found all the richest people we knew to lend us a couple of bob here and there. And then we we decided to get some spook serialized in the National What was the name of the book? The Spook Who Sat by the Door by Sam. And actually, spook is a sort of double entendre. It's a a slang word for a black man, a black person. And it's also a word for spy. And so this was actually, it was a tale about, which is still very relevant today. It's a tale about the CIA deciding they didn't have any um, black people in the organization. So they employed somebody to, sh- to show how diverse they were. And he's, he was a guy who sat by the door as it were. And he was, it was also a sort of satire because apart from um, looking, making the CIA look good, he was actually also organizing uh, freedom fighters in Chicago. So it's, uh, it's it, it went on to become a sort of cult Mm. Book, cult, was it this yeah. was fictionalized was it but it was a kind of based on a true story or or yeah, not it, so it, was, it was a it was a true it was a, it's a, a novel completely a novel yeah. okay. um, written by by sam Greeley, who had had worked um uh not, not he, uh, he wasn't a cia agent but no he, but he, he yeah you know so he had experience of of, of chicago and what he was writing about and yeah. he in fact went on to write the screenplay it became a a film. I was about to say, it sounds very filmic. It probably it was made was into filmed. a good film, wasn't it? Was it was filmed. It, it yeah. still is around and it's still a, a, a sort of cult movie, but it was kind yeah. of disappeared at a certain point because it was actually considered really dangerous yeah, as, very, as yeah. the story because it was sort of, 
you know, you employ somebody to show how inclusive you are, actually they're plotting against you behind your back. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember reading uh, something in, that was published in 1969. I remember reading an item in the Evening Standard in about 1974, I think whenever it was Patty Hearst was kidnapped. Oh yeah. And she, they, they were saying that the kidnappers, the Symbionese Liberation Army had been influenced by a gang in a novel called The Spook of Sat by the Door. <laughs> I suddenly felt I was kind of responsible for Patty Hearst's kidnap. Yeah. I don't know if it was true or not, but it's so amazing it, it, how books have afterlives, <laughs> isn't it? It's yeah, but it was. It was. It, it did have a lot. Of, it had a lot of attention. In fact, I remember. I remember because as, as I said, we started that we had no money, so we had no employees, so we were doing everything ourselves. So mm. I, I not only edited the book, but I, I did the cover, made it with letter set, and then we did the paperback edition. I remember selecting for the back of the paperback words from all the reviews, all the, the sort of most uh, startling or whatever words. So it was going you know, frightening, exciting, mm. terrifying, all, all the things that reviewers had said. So Spook was the first full-time book that Alison Busby did. And we went on from there. We, we, sold, we sold translation rights, we sold, we sold we sold it back to America. We didn't know what we were doing. So when people offered us 4% royalty, we didn't know we were being ripped off. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we learned as we went along. And, and we went on to publish, I think our next title was a novel by Michael Moorcock. Was um, it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was called Behold the Man. So we were publishing what we wanted to publish. We were rescuing yeah. things that had gone out of print. Mm -hmm. um, in the 70s, I be began republishing C.L.R. James, who was a very influential um, Trinidadian historian, um, who is, is still very well respected now, but it was totally uh, um, out of print. He wrote a very influential book called The Black Jacobins, which is still lauded today, but at yeah. that time was out of print. So we were republishing writers like C.L.R. James, and people assume whenever they talk about me as a black publisher that we were only publishing black writers. No, it was a completely um, eccentric, maverick list, mm. if you like. But just what you were interested in and what you what, wanted what to do. What we publish. decided we wanted to do. And, and yeah. we, were, we were breaking rules and we were finding writers. We found a writer in a pub, one of our, our early novelists, mm. Dolores Pilar. We, you know, we bumped into her in a pub. So we were doing whatever we wanted without uh, any view to what the conventions were or what we should yeah. have been doing. And, and somehow it worked. Yeah. It sounds wonderfully anarchic. And I wonder if you think that sort of publishing is still possible today? I think, I think today, sorry, my, my earphones Your are earphones. falling out. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I think I think that same spirit of doing things when you're young or, or when you when you break the conventions because you're doing what you believe in is still possible. And today it might be that the internet makes things mm. easier to to you know to, to sort of um, put out information. And of course, there's lots of organisations today, like the Independent Publishers Guild, exactly. who might help kind of young, up, you know, starting out publishers, which probably weren't around back in the sixties, were they? Well, they, they, I don't. Well, I, I can't remember when they started, but um, we we published Spook in 1969. But what what I do believe is that a lot of the smaller independent publishers who started up after we did, including women's, you know, the Women's Press or Virago, mm. I think in a way, I mean, maybe not consciously but in a way it showed that it could be done because you know two incompetence like Clive and I or <laughs> not incompetence but without any experience have done it and mm -hmm. and so I, I think that whole possibility of being a, an independent it started then it continues and it, it's still happening now there, there are mm -hmm. companies there are initiatives that are happening now which are based on people's enthusiasm, people's wish to disrupt the industry mm. in, in ways that I suspect not quite as young as you and Clive were though. So in this series, I talked to a fascinating <laughs> publisher in Berlin, Annette Michael, who had started, I would say, um, you know, rather later in life, but has started a very small press to talk about uh, refugees and African voices and all sorts of really interesting ah, marginal yeah. stuff. It's it's wonderful to see the kind of 
Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I love I love those sorts of initiatives, and I, I don't think age has has anything to do with it. I mean, no. one one of the things that I remember about Alice and the Busby is that we published a first novelist who was eighty five. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's never too late. <laughs> you didn't. She possibly didn't have many more books in them, which is not necessarily. Oh, I, do, I, do, I don't think you have to worry about. That. Sometimes people yeah. who publish first when they're in the twenties don't have many books left. In yes, them that's <laughs> absolutely true. You can't say that. So let's talk a little bit about what you did once you left Alison and Busby. Obviously, you've edited two kind of really um, amazing books about um, women. Black writers only, I think, or... Women of African descent. Women yeah. of African descent, that's right. Around the world, internationally. Which are kind of standard texts and kind of brought together an amazing oh, array you. of voices, um, and which is incredibly impressive. You've obviously broadcast and you've, you've, you've been an activist as well. And I think probably it's, we, we, we should talk a little bit about that. Um, you've, you've started or been involved in a couple of um, organisations that have been in seeking to increase representation in... in um, publishing, particularly black representation in publishing. Do you see any um, positive moves in that direction? I, I think there are positive moves always being made within the industry. And one of the things that actually makes me feel that I've achieved anything is when I see, when I talk to people who say, well, I was inspired to do X or Y or I was, you know, you influenced me to X or Y because I saw you doing it or I, I heard about you. And that makes me think, well, it was all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are lots of people who, uh, oh, I, I, my mind's gone blank. I can't name them all. But um, there are people who started after I did, the people who did all sorts of things in connection with publishing. I mean, people refer to me as the first black woman publisher in, in the UK. But uh, not long after I started in 19, I published, started publishing in 1967. In 1969, there was a, a wonderful woman called Jessica Huntley, who was actually a friend of mine mm. right until she died a few years ago. And she started a company called Bogle Louverture Publications. Yeah. So she was very in, influential as well as, as, a, as a black woman in the industry. And there have been other, because I, I keep stressing the black woman thing simply because this whole current view about inclusivity has to recognize that there were people who have been doing things, you know, without fanfare all along. Verna Wilkins, for example, who started Tamarind Books, a children's imprint in, in the 1980s. I can't remember which, 1987. Anyway, she started because she hadn't been able to find books that, in which her children mm. could find themselves represented. There, there are individual editors who have, made huge contributions, you know, Ella Wakatama. There, there are Elise Dillsworth, who is now an, a, a, an agent. Yes. There are individuals who have been within the industry as well as individuals outside the industry starting autonomous ventures. So I'd like to acknowledge that they have also laid the groundwork for, for mm -hmm. the current generation who are doing great things as well. And I think you're involved, is it the Black Writers um, Guild or? That, that's just started up really in response to Black Lives Matter? I'm, you know, I'm not actually involved in that. I mean, Charmaine Lovegrove is, 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 is involved with that. There, there are many wonderful writers involved in that. And one of the things I, I'm always talking about is the fact that we need to be on both sides of the divide. We want to be writers, we want to get our duos writers, we want to be published in a professional, in, in, in a, you know, a way that makes our reach as wide as it needs to be, but we also need to be in the meeting rooms to making the decisions about who gets taken on. Mm. And we have to be in publishing at every level. So it's not just in the editorial department, it's in, in the publicity department, in the sales department, so that we can actually have some sort of way of influencing how those books get to their readership. And it's not mm. simply that, black books are only read by black readers or, or white books only by white readers. So it's a question of making the whole industry richer for both the readers and the writers. And we have to be not only within organizations for writers, but within the whole industry, the publishing side as well. So we're not always going with a begging bowl to, yeah. to those in charge saying, do this for us. Mm -hmm. We can do things for ourselves as well. 
I mean, my sense is certainly over the last couple of years, there has been a much wider uh, range of books from more diverse voices. I think Mm -hmm. definitely in terms of the publishing output, it's got much better. I don't think it's particularly changed in the boardrooms, Um, but Mm -hmm. that change takes much longer, of course. Yeah, no, I think you're you're right. And it's it's not in fact it's not only within the publishing industry, publishing companies, it's also within you know on the books pages. Yes. You know, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who does the reviewing is is throughout the whole yeah. the whole industry. And I, I mean I remember there have been occasions when I've done a lot of reviewing and the assumption is that I only read or books review by black writers. Black people. Or, you know, I've done radio <laughs> programs and they asked me to do things about black books. And, and I remember once actually on a, a books program on the radio saying something to the effect of actually I do read black white writers as well. And, and I knew as I was saying it that I was shooting myself in the foot because then they'll be too embarrassed to give me black books and they still won't give me white books. So I'll let them do <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, so um, I was particularly heartened to read My Sister's The Serial Killer, I think, last year or this year, because that's just a book who could be written by any writer of any colour or any, I think it's a wonderful book. And I just thought, this is what we're all talking about, just any book by anyone. I mean, you know, it's just wonderful. And I, I think there are publishing companies that have without making a great fanfare about initiatives and being mm. inclusive, have just done that, published yeah. good books by good writers, whether or not they're, they're of an ethnicity that you know, makes the, the publisher looks good, just they're, they're good books. And, mm. and you know, they, they proved that this works because they've gone on to win prizes. And sell a lot of copies as well. Exactly. So, so it's, yeah. it's not just this year where people are suddenly aware of the Black Lives Matter movement and yeah. the response of the George Floyd killing and so on are now saying, well, we are your allies. No, it's, it's always been the case that there are individuals, individual companies who know what the, the thing to do is. In fact, you mentioned Charmaine Lovegrove and she is um, running um, Dialogue Books, which is part of um, the Ashit group. Mm-hmm. And I, I always find it quite um, interesting that, that the the boss of that group is a man called David Shelley, who began his career in Alice and Busby. Did he? My <laughs> Not goodness when I was me. there, but I mean, I think yeah. he would have seen the sort of diversity within the list. So How interesting. It's, yeah. it's, it, it can actually show you that there is a range in the literary canon that that's actually makes everybody richer. And mm. David has done that with our share and, and Charmaine's doing it with dialogue, and there are other individuals. There, there are companies like Cassava Republic Press, run by Bibi Bakari Yusuf, who I know has very kindly said that my existence helped her start. That there, mm-hmm. there are, in fact, I, I, one of the things I remember from the la- one of the last book fair, London book fair I went to. Did we have one last year or the year before? Anyway. We had one last year, not this year. Yeah. Well, then, yeah, but I, I remember meeting this young black woman um, at the stand of Jonathan Ball, who are the South African publishers South African people, yeah. of, yeah. of New Doors of Africa. And she was called Inkanyezi Shabalala. And she told me that she had been inspired to go into publishing. She's, she's now the, the publisher of Jonathan Ball, I believe. Mm-hmm. And she'd been inspired to become a publisher because she had come across me and the Alison Busby books. So that makes me feel it's all worthwhile. Yeah. When I-, I mean, you've got a huge legacy there. So let's just finish briefly by talking a little bit about um, your chairmanship of the Booker this year. Um, obviously, that involved you reading hundreds, hundreds of books. Um, and- <laughs> I know it's extraordinary. I don't know how the judges do it. And you came up with an extraordinarily interesting list, fresh voices, you know, authors I hadn't heard of. And I call myself a bookwoman. I just hadn't heard of most of the authors you found on your shortlist. And they've all got such amazing stories to tell. Were you mm. were you pleased? Was there any? I was dissension? pleased. But I mean, pe- people people think it was a sort of some sort of a curated list, but no, I, I had wonderful co-judges. Um, mm-hmm. Lee Child, yes, yeah. Emily Wilson, <laughs> Samir Rahim, Lem Suse. We were all very different. We all cover the spectrum from writing to editing yeah. to publishing to reviewing. 
And we're all very different, different age groups, different geographical locations, different ethnicities. Different interests, and, yeah. Different interests, different everything. And we, we just, and we were not reading books, checking passports or whether mm. they were debuts or not, but we actually came together with a long list and then a short list and then a winner, which we all stood behind and which everybody remarks upon as mm -hmm. being interesting for its diversity and so on. And it, it, it was certainly not something not intended, that was a, but yes, just a, wasn't an intentional way of, of yeah. coming up with a list. It just shows you that if you, maybe we, we were just the right judges, if you like. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I think it just shows you that, that there is all that diversity out there, what's been published. Yeah. And all we're doing is choosing from what's been published by the British publishing industry. Mm -hmm. So that shows you that the industry itself is doing things that are it's coming up with really place. interesting voices. Yes. I, mean, I mean, it was an extraordinarily difficult uh, list to call on term, in terms of who is going to be the winner. I mean, we all sat around saying, "Are we going to make a prediction?" And then, you know, we well, just that's couldn't. It. And, it, and the thing is, it's, it's difficult to say. I, you know, I, I love long lists and I love short lists and I love winners. But when you have a winner, you're not saying only read this book this year. Mm. You're saying. No, read lots of books this yeah. year. No, no, no. And I've got most of them on my my Christmas book exactly. list. So I'm absolutely delighted. And even delighted. ones who didn't, ones who didn't make the long list, there are lots of books I'd love people to read, and I'm yeah. sure every judge would love people to read. So it's just yeah. keep reading, support the writers, support the books, support the publishers, support the bookshops, and we'll yeah. all be happier. Yeah. Well, that was lovely, Margaret. Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, I think we've probably run out of our allotted time now. Oh, so I I'll wanted say... to say much more. <laughs> Sorry, I, was... I, I wanted to tell you about, actually, you mentioned New Daughters of Africa. I didn't, I didn't actually tell you about it because one of the things that I love about the fact that this anthology um, is, is around is that everybody who's in it waived their fees and because of that, okay. there is a scholarship that has happened, which means that a woman student from Africa will get a free course of study at SOAS. And so New Daughters of Africa, which again, another thing I should say, that the original Daughters of Africa was commissioned by a woman called Candida Lacey, who at that time was working at Pandora Press, a women's imprint. And it, she moved on to come, eventually be a commissioning editor of Jonathan Kate. So the book came out from Jonathan Kate. And then she is now the publisher of Myriad Edition. So she is the one who commissioned me to do New Daughters of Africa. So there's this <laughs> wonderful continuum and-, and My it, symbiotic you know, it, relationship there. Exactly. Right. So kudos no. to Canada. Well, it sounds a wonderful book and I shall look forward to, to reading it thank soon, you. I hope. Um, thank you very much, Margaret. That's been thank terrific. You. Okay, thank you bye. So. Thank you.